right. Thanks for coming. <coughs> Um, this is the second seminar in a series that we're calling Rational Learning. Um, recognize some of you from the first uh, seminar. Appreciate you coming. We've got a few people online following along. Okay. <coughs> Welcome. Um, okay. So. What's this about? I thought what I would do to begin is uh, briefly review where I'm coming from, where this is coming from. Um, I'm preparing to teach a class next year uh, as a special topics class um, called Rational Learning. And it'll be an interdisciplinary class taught through liberal arts. Uh, the description is here. So the overall objective of the course is to broaden students' perspectives through a series of lectures and interactive sessions. It'll be a blend of uh, some things that we don't usually think of blending. Probability, philosophy, scientific inquiry, mindfulness practice, and what I'll call common sense. With the goal being to develop a rational and research-backed understanding of ourselves and our interconnectedness with all things. So other people, other things uh, generally. We'll have guest speakers from all around campus. So uh, Professor Gil Rosenthal will come talk to us about um, Darwin and evolutionary theory and what it tells us about where we come from and uh, why we arguably aren't all that significant in the grand scheme of things. Uh, from communication, Dr. Rama Subramanian will talk to us about uh, mindfulness. She's an expert in mindfulness. Dr. Donnelly Docks will also talk about mindfulness and uh, loving thinking, compassionate thinking, um, what, what's called interiority, so kind of self-reflective uh, thinking. Professor Dan Conway and um, Joshua Hicks from, philo from philosophy will talk to us about some topics in philosophy. So last time I mentioned some <coughs> topics from existentialism. Uh, and I'm going to have these folks talk more about it because they're the experts. A couple of folks from physics and astronomy to talk about uh, size and age of the universe and our very, very insignificant role in it. Uh, and then I think I have a couple of folks coming from psychology. In the last seminar, this was what we talked about. So I won't go through all of it in detail, but uh, we started by thinking about what do we know, how do we know it, and how do we learn things? So uh, using rational thinking, using scientific inquiry, uh, testing and questioning claims and hypotheses, steering away from uh, certainty in our beliefs, always being willing to consider new evidence and uh, refine our beliefs. Talked about how there is a rational perspective from which there is absolutely no difference between you and me, or me and a tree, or me and an apple. Uh, the idea that we are all just uh, constellations of atoms organized in a particular way at this particular moment. And with that kind of perspective in mind, it fosters an inclusive and compassionate worldview. If I don't see that I'm different from you, or, I, or you are different from him, or she's different from her, uh, there is no basis for um, exclusive thinking. <clears throat> so we talked about how, a, a, and I'm trying to make a, a, like a rational, naturalistic, as much as possible argument for uh, inclusive and compassionate thinking. So that's what we talked about. Then we talked about beliefs. And uh, beliefs being things that, that we hold to be true, but that cannot be proven, and in many cases can't be disproven either. So 
talked about a variety of ways that can happen, politics, religion, uh, many ways that, that if I believe for, for, with uh, great certainty that I know the answer and your answer is not the right one, and if you're thinking the same way, that's inevitably going to lead to conflict. So then we said, well, what if we didn't hold on to our beliefs? If I can't prove it and you can't disprove it, what if I step aside from beliefs? Um, and so this was where the idea of existentialism came in, uh, philosophy, thinking about what if you don't have anything that you believe? What's the point of living if you don't have uh, some sort of grand purpose in your life? So we talked about, for example, okay, uh, the Greek mythology of Sisyphus, right? Sisyphus, who was doomed to live this absurd life, no purpose to his life, just push this enormous stone up to the top of the mountain and uh, cursed to watch it crawl, you know, crash down the other side of the mountain and go over and start again <clears throat> for all eternity. What kind of life is that? You know, what's the point of living? What were his options? One option would be to rail at the heavens and say, this isn't fair. I don't like this life. Um, Another option that we, that we took from some of the existential writers is to be present in that experience with your full attention and with your full passion. Even pushing a rock up a mountain for all eternity can be fulfilling, can be uh, enriching, can be worth doing for eternity if thought in the right way. And then I finished with... Uh, thinking about each of us are interested, I think we would all agree, in living a quality life, living our lives well with fulfillment, uh, passion, and, and all good things for our life. We want that. And the argument can be made, I claim, that we can achieve quality living and arguably optimize our living when we choose loving things to do. And by love, we mean uh, not uh, like the way you love your spouse necessarily, not a uh, romantic love, but a love that is um, wanting and willing to contribute to good things for uh, someone. Could be you, yourself, could be others. So that's the idea. I'm trying to... Uh, argue for using rational, naturalistic, as much as possible, and research-backed arguments for an inclusive and compassionate worldview, and to encourage students here on campus to think in terms of mapping out a life that is optimized, that is high quality, and thinking about trying to achieve that through um, loving action. Not looking for one, number one, not looking for self, money, prestige, all those things, but rather wanting good things for self and others. This is the thesis that I'm proposing for the course. Um, I'll just read it and we'll revisit it later because it's going to be the basis of what we discuss. I hope to have a fair amount of discussion tonight. So, proposal is... <clears throat> that a rational, reasonable, and research-backed proposal can be made that the self is optimized by mindfully choosing, like in the moment, uh, in the moment, not thinking of future or past, but in the moment choosing how to respond, conditional on the setting, what are we doing, what are we, uh, what's going on at this moment, conditional on that setting, and your abilities and maybe disabilities, with the intention of maximizing the, quote, quality of that moment, and we talked about quality last time, and hopefully contributing through forethought substantially to the cumulative lifetime quality for you and for all. And the proposal is that this outcome follows naturally when we're using love as the basis for what we're choosing to do the desire for and willingness to contribute to good things for you and for all. Okay, so tonight, 
a continuation of that discussion. <clears throat> what I'd like to talk about is uh, ways in which there are us versus them kind of mindsets in the world, in our community, certainly on our campus. How does that happen? What does it look like? And what I would like to challenge you to do this evening is think about how do you fit into both of those categories? In what ways are you part of the us? And then who's the them? Who's different? For, who do you consider different from you? Who's not part of your crowd? What do you think about them? And what do you think they think about you? And then I'd also like you to think about, in what way are you part of the them, the not included group, uh, maybe the marginalized group? And in that context, who's the included group? Who's us in that context? And again, what do you think about us? And what do you think we think about you? So we'll do a little bit of reflection. I'm going to give you a little bit of time to write down some thoughts in a moment. And then I'd like us to discuss it. I'd like us all to think, I think probably most of us know what it's like to be different in some ways. Um, and so I'd like to discuss that a little bit. What is it like to be different? Part of being a compassionate, inclusive person is having empathy and compassion for other people. Uh, and, and that can come from feeling different yourself because you know what it feels like when you're not part of the in group. So let's talk a little bit about what is it like to be different, for somebody to be different. What are ways that people are different on our campus, for example? So then we'll take a moment to do some reflection. I have a Qualtrics um, survey that I'll point you to, and I'd like you to spend a few minutes writing. Then we'll discuss. And the, the real goal for this talk <coughs> and the seminar series is to uh, get a few people together who are interested in doing something on campus, in our community, uh, in this direction. So trying to impact uh, in, and uh, foster inclusivity, diversity, compassionate thinking on campus. So I would like us to think and brainstorm a little bit, what could a handful of people do on campus? I think we could do something uh, without spending lots of money, without spending lots of our time necessarily. I think there are many ways that if we if we thought about it and put our minds to it and were motivated for it, we could make people think. If you just made a few people think about what it's like to be maybe a first generation student on campus. What's that like when you grew up and your whole family were Aggies and you've got your parents paying for the condo that you can live in and you have a nice car to drive on campus? Uh, what is it like when you're not that? And how could we raise maybe awareness of those kinds of issues? How could we make people think a little bit? All right. So us versus them. Uh, not very hard to find ways that this shows up today. Presidential election is full of it. Um, CNN is full of it every day. Uh, so let's just think of a few examples here. Well, let me say something first. What is this us versus them thing, and how does it happen? Uh, I think part of this is due to when you're raised in a particular uh, culture, it's very natural to just adopt that belief system and the principles and the, the, uh, the, the beliefs of that system. In a way, humans are uh, very prone to herd behavior. I will tend to believe what my parents believe, what my friends believe, um, whatever the majority group that I'm a part of believes. So embedded belief systems Maybe you grew up in a belief system and it has a great hold on you. I grew up in a, a fundamentalist Christian system and it is extremely, you know, when you have that kind of cultural pressure, familial pressure, it can really shape people's uh, behaviors and beliefs. So 
that can lead to um, lack of appreciation and empathy for people who are not part of your group. I'm in my group. I have the right answer. You're not in my group. Something's wrong with you. So some examples, nationality. We're all, or not all, but many of us are Americans. And uh, we think very highly of ourselves. We've got a presidential candidate, you know, arguing for a wall to keep out the, the foreigners. Um, look around the world, you see lots of conflict between nationalities. Pride in my group. And uh, we are happy to pitch it like it's us versus you. It's our country. Race, certainly. Uh, still continues uh, to be a major issue. And uh, it's, the same, it's the same dynamic. If you're not part of my race, <clears throat> you grew up in a different culture. You drew, grew, up, grew up with different um, experiences and, and uh, uh, characteristics. So there are differences. And you can see just by looking at the, the uh, news articles these days and watching the uh, Trump um, rallies that there's strong uh, feelings about race versus race. Ethnicity, uh, different parts of the world. You have people who live very close to each other who are slightly different in their ethnic background and uh, willing to kill each other for it. Same thing with religion. <clears throat> Even within the same religion, I believe this flavor of, that, of the religion, you believe that flavor, flavor of the religion, and so let's kill each other over it. And Christianity is not immune to that. Christianity is a little more mature maybe than some other, like older than some, so maybe it's uh, progressed beyond the crusade type days. But religion fundamentally is an adherence to a belief system. My beliefs, if you're not part of my beliefs, there's conflict. Sexual orientation. Uh, what is it like to grow up in today's culture not a heterosexual? We have friends, and it seems like every friend I have who has a, a different sexual orientation has a lot of baggage, pain from uh, rejection from judgment, you know, so. Appearance, something maybe we don't always think about. We're not all as beautiful as I am. So if you're not as beautiful as I am, uh, how does that make you feel? It's, it's uh, a real um, feature. It's something I, I struggle with. Uh, just a, it's like a natural reaction you're drawn to people who are attractive, who you find attractive, and you don't want to be around people you don't find attractive. So how does that make that person feel who's, who's in that category? To live your life where you always have that feeling that people don't really want to be around you. Or how about a disability? There's at least one person in the room with a disability, and uh, so you go through your life, and there's some things you can't do that other people can do. Uh, that's challenging. So there are many ways that we can orient ourselves into my category and you're in a different category. <clears throat> Let's think about what it is like to be different. So suppose you are a different sexual orientation and you're on a conservative campus like a and uh, What's that going to be like? If you don't have a sufficient support network, when you're different, you can find these wonderful effects here. Loneliness, disconnection, no uh, com community, a low self-worth. If you don't belong to the group, if you're not accepted by the group, that will tend to translate to something's wrong with me. And that comes hand in hand with depression, anxiety. <coughs> That said, if you have some ways that you are different, perhaps you would agree that being different can have some benefits. When you don't fit in, 
it's harder to just sail through life without thinking about stuff. So when you are different, potentially, you have the opportunity to have some extra depth to yourself, some extra perspective on what <clears throat> life is really about, what really matters, and what doesn't matter, and compassion for other people. If you're different, it's easier to feel for, people who, who, for other people who are different. So I'm going to ask you to think in just a second about ways that you're part of an in-group, who's the other group? And then ways that you're part of the other group, who's the main group? And what are the feelings between? So to get the juices flowing, I'll share a personal, a personal story. <clears throat> um, so I grew up always feeling uh, a little different from other people. Never felt like I fit in. Uh, never felt like I was good enough. Never felt like I was smart enough. Um, pushed myself really hard to go to graduate school. Got a PhD. Uh, got a job at a good university. Had tenure. Good things. Married with three kids. But about three years ago, um, these feelings that have been in my mind for my entire life you're no good, you're not smart enough, you're not good enough, came to a head and I almost killed myself. So I went to the emergency room, called my wife, ended up in a, uh, one of those mental places, and got to spend a couple of nights. And even there, the people that I was rubbing shoulders with, the guy with no fingers, a lady who was addicted to um, pain medication, a uh, schizophrenic lady who was running around naked, they told me, you don't belong here. So I went home, and uh, I remember get, when my wife picked me up, and my youngest son came, came with her, and uh, really, mm. <clears throat> So I know what it's like to feel different. Um, and I would like you to be at least aware that people feel that way. And when you feel that way, uh, you're living a different life than a lot of people on campus. There's a lot of people on campus in the community who are very comfortable. They've got things figured out. They've got their support network. They've got their um, whatever it is. And then there's others who don't. And what I would like us to think about is how can we reach out and, and make it some kind of difference for folks around us who are in similar situations. OK, so if you've got a computer, would you please go to this URL? <clears throat> and I've just got a handful of questions for you there. Question one is name one way that you are part of an inclusive us. So how are, what is a way that you are part of an in crowd? And then the next few questions ask uh, to, to be detailed or to think more about that specific context. So in that context, you're part of us. Who then is they? Who's the other group? What do you believe about them? that other group. They're different, they're not as smart, they are dirty, they're ugly, or what? Who, what do you think? And what do you think they believe about you? You're arrogant, you're not uh, understanding, or what is it? And then the next four questions are uh, to switch and think about now what way are you part of and excluded them? Who's us in that context? What do you believe about the us? And what do you think the us believes about you? The last question is, are you willing to have your, these are anonymous, there's not going to be any names shown. Are you willing to have us discuss what you, what you uh, propose? I'm not going to show them, but I would, if you're willing, I would bring them up on my computer and just read out something for us to discuss. You don't have to. But let's take, uh, say, five minutes. And fill this out, please.
you can just type this into your URL. <coughs> So suppose you're a first generation student on campus. You've never been to, you know, nobody in your, in your family's ever been to college. Here you are the very first time. The majority of people on campus come from families that have been to college. So you're different if that's, the, if that's you. That's what I mean. So in what way are you part of a, uh, a minority group, a, an excluded group, in some way not part of a mainstream group. If you can't think of one, you're lucky. <laughs> what about name one way that you are part of an excluded them? That's what I'm trying to explain. Do, KK. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to trying to get you to think about ways that is there a way is there a comparison where you are different from other people that could that doesn't have to necessarily mean you're in a minority group mm -hmm. but do you have friends for example who believe something and you don't believe that uh, are you a minority are you a different sexual orientation something like that 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 you feel like you fall into not the uh, dominant or main group. It may be that you don't have one, <laughs> or at least not an obvious one. And that's fine. If you don't have one, a way that you feel like you're not, if you don't have a way that you feel like you're part of a, a, a them, then you certainly should have ways that you feel that you're part of an us. If you're not them, you're us. You're part of a main group. You're the, you're the, um, you're the dominant group, white Caucasian coming from a generation of Aggies is us. First generation student is them. <coughs> so have a think. If you need to leave it blank, that's fine.
So some of these are good already. couple more minutes. Okay, so for example, thanks for sharing among those who shared. Uh, let's see. So, one way, so here's one person's answer. One way that you are in part of a group. So here's your group. One person's group is Democrat. So they are not necessarily like dominant versus recessive. It doesn't have to be. But you are part of a group, Democrats. You can be a part of a member of a community of people who think similarly to you. That's your us. Who's they? Who's the other group? They said Republican. Okay. What do you believe about them? So what is a, as a Democrat, thinking I'm speaking for this person, as a Democrat, what do you think about Republicans? So they are myopic and self-absorbed, is the answer. What do you think they believe about your group? Liberal fools with no fiscal sense or morals. One way that you are part of an excluded them. A very open-minded Christian that is accepting of all people and all beliefs. So that's your group, how could you, who are you different from if that is your category? How about conservative fundamentalist Christians who don't share those uh, inclusive views that you have? And then from your perspective, open-minded Christian perspective, what do you think about the us, the group that you're not a part of? They are myopic and self-absorbed. And what do you think they believe about your group? You don't follow the Bible, you're going to go to hell. Another one. What is your us group? Heterosexual, heterosexual female. Who might be the other group? Homosexual or transgender? What do you believe about them? So I, this is a good answer. They are discriminated. Their desires are not respected by some people in this society. We could 
certainly think of other people who are part of that heterosexual group who would have less pleasant thoughts about the homosexual group. They're wrong, they're sinning, they're dirty, stuff like that. Um, and what do you think they would believe about your group? So again, this was a thoughtful answer. They wish to have the same rights, marriage rights and so on, as us, um, and treated as other people, like any other person. One way that you are part of a, a different group, Asian, a minority on campus. You're different from who? All the Americans on campus. What do you think about those Americans? They are the center of the world. They are superior and have little knowledge of other parts of the world, especially for Asian cultures. And what do you think they think about your group? Asians are all the same. Doesn't matter which country they came from. They're nerdy, not interesting at all, and they're here to steal Americans' jobs. So it's easy, easy to kind of laugh at that. But if I'm an Asian, that probably stings a little bit. Because pro I probably feel like, yeah, that's true. I, I feel that. <clears throat> How about... This is a good one. Um, what part... Or, okay, so here's a group that you're a part of. Many people only have uh, one parent living, and I'm one of them. So you only have one parent living. Everybody else, it seems, has both their parents. What do you think about those folks? They may not understand what it's like to lose a parent. Maybe they take their parents for granted and they don't seem to value the love, admiration, and care that their parents have for them. What do you think that they, the folks with two parents, think about you? They think we should get over it already. But they don't know that you only get one mother and father, and when they're taken away from you at a young age, you don't get to show them the jump shot you've been practicing on or that you're pursuing your degree. A way that you are part of an excluded group. Maybe I don't come from a family of Aggies. Many people do around here. What do you think about that other group? They're privileged. What do you think that group believes about your group? You chose to come here, suck it up. If you don't feel like you fit in, you chose to come here, suck it up. Okay. There are others. I won't go through all of them. Thank you for sharing. I hope that that was somewhat useful to illustrate. Um, every one of us is aware of ways that there are differences. There are us's and there are them's on campus. And many of us are affected by it in real ways. Okay. Uh, so let me remind about this idea the claim is that you will be most fulfilled, you will be happiest, you will be uh, passionate, you will have health and essentially all good things when you pursue loving things. There's science to say uh, mindful, compassionate, introspective, inclusive thinking is good for you. And it's also obviously good for others. We talked last time about ways that humans are a super organism. I can't make my own food. I'm not a subsistence farmer. I'm dependent on other people. You're dependent on other people. And 
from a rational perspective, seeing that there's really no difference between two people. We're atoms. We're not going to be here very long. Soon when we're gone, those atoms will go become something else. So from, a, from that perspective, we are not different from each other. And good things for you are then good things for me. So thinking in terms of, I want to live a good life, a quality life. I believe that the path to doing that is to live a loving life. So that's why I'm doing this whole thing. I, this is my effort to do loving, quality things. And I can attest, it feels good. It feels good to think about things that would benefit other people. So I'd like to encourage you to work with me and do something on campus. So let's think about, clearly, there is us, there is them in our lives, on this campus, in this community. So let's talk for a moment about what could a handful of people <clears throat> do to impact our campus and our community. One option would be to go to the corner, the corner of Texas and University, and just start yelling out how stupid the Republicans are, what, you know, whatever we want to uh, impact. If our, if our hot button issue is politics, one, pot, one strategy would be to be an abrasive, in your face, uh, argumentative, kind of violent effort at swaying other people. So we're not aiming for that. We're thinking in terms of loving things to do. So what could we do with criteria like these? Safe, as in we're not going to uh, do something that is dangerous, could hurt somebody, could get somebody hurt, or in trouble, or uh, exposed to dangerous things. Responsible, so thinking things through, not going to start a riot or incite arguments among people, that kind of thing. And most important, loving. So wanting good things for other people, not to impose our will on other people or to show people how smart or wonderful we are, but genuinely thinking about making good things for other people. Something that is impactful and thought-provoking. So another option would be to just throw a bunch of flyers out you know, in the quad. Did you know that there's some people on campus who are different? probably not going to be very impactful. Nobody's going to look at it. They'll just throw it in the trash. So we're smart people. Can we think up creative ways that would be impactful and thought provoking? Something that would make people talk. Did you see that thing that happened the other day? Did you see that YouTube video? I don't know who did it, but it really got me thinking. Or did you see that, that enacted play that somebody did out on the quad? That was weird. It was different. It made me think. Um, <clears throat> possibly anonymous. When you do something ano with anonymity, that arguably ramps up the impact and quality, I would argue. If you're not putting your name on it, then you're not asking for the praise. It's, this is not this group of people looking for uh, a pat on the back. Something to think about. Anonymous. And then this guerrilla style. This is something uh, that is a kind of a pet idea of mine. There was, a, there was an article recently on CNN, and the title was, um, This uh, Pinterest star is not who she seems. So the, the article went in and had these pictures of this beautiful French girl and all, you know, all these different exotic locations on the beach, on a boat. And uh, she started this. Um, account and she got like 50,000 followers because she was glamorous and she was always doing fun things. Um, and then after a year it was revealed that it was a hoax essentially. It was put on by a marketing group. It was a guerrilla marketing campaign. And the idea was in every picture there was this glamorous girl in every single picture she had an alcoholic drink in her hand. 
And the intended impact of that was simply to make people think about addiction in that case. Uh, the, idea, the, the message was sometimes we miss the signs. We saw the beautiful woman. Nobody really paid attention to the fact she always was drinking. That kind of thing, I think, could be really impactful. Um, because by the time you have followed that story, and then you realize somebody went to all this trouble, spent the money to do this video and this whole campaign, not to make money and not to get famous or get praise for themselves, but to try to impact other people in a loving way, arguably. There's some folks on campus who kind of specialize in um, storytelling, personal storytelling, digital storytelling. And I've talked to them about possibly doing um, some kind of media project where possibly members of our group contribute stories. Uh, and we work to turn them into visual stories that can be impactful. So not just you standing against a wall and telling your story, but maybe in an artistic way with media and with music and, and uh, production value to have impact. So one possibility would be, what if we got together, any of you who are interested after this, and came up with a few scenarios to enact in a, in a YouTube video to try to raise awareness of these uh, cultural differences and things like that. It could be interviews, scripted interviews, uh, with anonymous actors, possibly. Tell us your story. I grew up in Saudi Arabia or Iraq, Iran. I was raised such and such a way. My family were all Muslims for as long as I've known. So I believe these things. My parents raised me this way. I came to this country. I don't know anybody. First in my family to come to a, a university in the US. Everybody's different from me here. I don't have many friends. My family's gone. Stories like that told in a, um, in a careful way could make people think. So let me ask you, do you have any ideas? Do you ever think about this kind of thing? And do you have any ideas for maybe issues that a group of people could target? Racism, uh, sexism, whatever it is, xenophobia. What do you think are the big impact issues on this campus? For, let's, let's think about this campus. Do any of you have uh, thoughts on specific topics that we could maybe uh, try to take a whack at and make it some impact on. We've seen some through the feedback here. Differences in cultures, um, differences in familial, relation, in familial makeups. We've got differences in abilities and disabilities. Anybody have any ideas? Visa status. Visa status. Okay. Care to elaborate? Yeah, I think so. So if you can persuade employers you know, to hire more international students, which are technically eighty percent of grad students on campus. So international students on campus with a with a visa who have difficulties securing positions. Yeah. Okay. What would your what might be an impactful message? We can't necessarily go to the, uh, the university and say, hey, we decided we want to have uh, <laughs> jobs for everybody with a visa. Well, you can't. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the second way is just to educate. Educate. So who would you educate, do you think? Lawyers. Students? Employers. Who? Employers. Employers. They don't Employers. care about you know, options to hire. Yeah, we steal some jobs from Americans, 
So what if there was a, uh, an interview with somebody who's in that position? This is what it's like from my perspective. Of course, we'd want to be really careful. I mean, my goal is this is to be uh, safe, responsible, loving, not caustic and in your face or, or violent. Um, but we could definitely have a story that's told from the perspective of international student on campus, and these are my challenges. So definitely, I'll write down a note, a possibility of, uh, if we're going to do something, one thing we could include in it is perspectives from international students. And, maybe, and it's not necessarily aimed at your peers, apparently. It's aimed maybe up. What else? That's something uh, for government to decide, and the law entities and things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, a question that I usually ask myself is that uh, U.S. have has this uh, lottery for uh, granting uh, numerous uh, number of uh, PRs for people in uh, that they don't uh, have the eligibility to come here. But for example, they are very uh, uh, hard to get that permission to a student that already lived here for I don't know how many years, and they just want to bring someone from nowhere. And that's the question. I mean, if a uh, focus group uh, uh, that is uh, that has some uh, specialties can bring some questions like this that may provoke some uh, thought for the people in uh, politics and those people. Because if you look at other countries like Germany, like uh, United Kingdom, especially Germany, they value the, uh, the or Canada, they usually value the skilled immigrants and also the people who especially in Germany, the, the people who already uh, studied there. Mm -hmm. So that's something to obtain for them. Okay. How about a, uh, an effort to raise awareness on campus among your peers that international students are people yeah. working hard, not here to steal jobs, um, 
if your peers are aware of those things, your peers may end up being politicians one day, you know. Um, so I think, okay, so I'm hearing a theme so far that, that international students is something that maybe we could uh, do something with, try to do something with. Anybody else? Um, Definitely appears racism is still pretty blatant. Mm -hmm. I think. You guys, we saw the first generation retention students, uh, retention of first generation students uh, data recently that you shared. Um, retention for whites, I think, was pretty steady over the last several years. Hispanics going down and blacks going way down, it seemed like. And the reasons that people gave on their exit interviews, this doesn't feel like a campus for me. I don't, you know, this isn't a camp, I, I'm not part of this campus. Uh, I'm not welcome at this campus, things like that, definitely. Um, if you had an opportunity and an invitation to donate eight hours of your time to help design and maybe participate in something like this. Suppose we had a few thousand dollars and we were gonna make some media, a few YouTube videos or something. You don't have to raise your hand, but think about it. Would you be willing to contribute and work with a group? I would like to have a group like you all that maybe we meet again in late November and focus our thoughts on one or two or three specific things and then do them. I'll pay for it. Actually, I think we can write a small grant, diversity grant, and mm -hmm. in that place. So if we can come up with the idea. So I think it would be great to receive more input from the students about the issue. So why do you think you have a hard time to be part here? Do you think the uh, employee, employers uh, they don't see it the way they should? So if we get more, can get more facts, certainly. I can that's send you more facts if you want. That's great. Yeah. It's sure. Good. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I will send around some further information later this week or next week sometime, and I'll be asking you to uh, contribute ideas and your time maybe meet with this again uh, late November. I plan to have another meeting on the 30th. What I would like for that to be is let's talk more details about specific things that we're going to do. Unless somebody has a better idea, I like the idea of let's make a handful of YouTube videos. High production value, creative, thoughtful. Let's say something about what it's like to be an international student. Let's maybe say something about what it's like to be of a different race. Let's maybe say something about what it's like to have a disability. Okay, that's all I planned to uh, talk about. Any further comments or suggestions? I'll let you go. Thanks a lot for coming. Yes, go ahead. Um, okay, so same thing for me. I'm thankful because I think the biggest thing I learned today is that love can be an organized action. So, well, the question I have standing from that is, do you think that we often ignore love at a systemic level where it would really make a difference because there is the perception that being objective is the enemy of being subjective? Do you think those two things should be put together? Is I think that's the reason why it's often ignored at the
Mm. I think it's, I, I probably can't answer your question perfectly. I think the, the default for people is to fall into comfort zones as part of your accepted group. Um, I, I tend to think about religion because it still stings for me. In the Christian world, that's your family. You're all right. Everybody's right. And everybody else out there is going to hell and they're wrong. Something's wrong with them. And yet we, we would call ourselves loving. We're loving. We're all here. We're very loving to each other. But we're loving in, interiorly. Like, um, what's the word? Uh, not inclusive, but like uh, exclusive, yeah. We love our kind, you know. I think the challenge for many of us, just I guess by nature, is to, is, is to uh, think in terms of letting that go outside of our circles. Um, but I don't know how to answer your question otherwise. Any, Carolyn? <laughs> So I was saying, I think love, what I learned today is that love can be an organized action. But then, and I feel like at the systemic level where there's policies and other things that can be true in your culture, it's almost like, it's like this, oh, well, no, not too much subjectivity, so let's not be as subjective. So I'm trying to ask, like, is that why, you know, these kinds of things are not talked about at even an, at, 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 at a higher level? Because we think that if we're too subjective, we cannot be objective. So it's like, why can't you two things exist? that makes sense. So it's like sentiment versus being objective. Okay. I'll take the stab just that. I think you really can't almost legislate love. I mean, you can't. It's one of these intangible. Um, so being an administrator of a type, you get these issues and, and you want behavior to change, but how do you help behavior change? And what the beauty of what this is, I think, is it's a groundswell. It's from, you know, I, I followed a little bit about what happened with President Young and the apologies, and, and what I hear is people are tired of apologies, they want change. Um, and you may be able to make rules and try to enforce. But really, I think what we're after is, and what this is describing, is changing people's hearts, you know, opening them up. Like, maybe someone doesn't even know what they're doing is racist because they've never had, they've, they've never been open enough to hear what someone's saying. They're so steeped in what they think is correct. It's, it's like what Dr. Dabney's saying about the about fundamentalist Christians sometimes is it's it's ingrained so to speak and and, it, and I don't think racism is necessarily color specific I think it, it can be all forms of racism but um, and so so I think it's hard for the admin to do something and really have wholesale change because there's there can still be resistance to that. You know, I mean, I can remember when we started diversity training at New Student Congress and people hated that. It felt like it was shoved down their throat. So whatever, you really you really want an openness that I think maybe this has the opportunity to bring that um, something at a presidential level perhaps may not. So in case you guys don't know, this is Dr. Tim Scott. Associate Dean for Undergraduate Studies in the College of Science, Dr. Carolyn Sandoval, um, Instructional Consultant with Center for Teaching Excellence, and my colleague, Dr. Daria Ackelman from Department of Statistics. I'm trying to be incognito. <laughs> <laughs> Busted. I would just want to build on what you said yeah. really quickly. Sometimes, too, I think that the people, people who have been targets of hate for so many years also have developed a sort of um, hardened, you know, a, a hardness about that. And so when I think about some of the students who have been really vocal about how they have experienced racism on campus, I'm so proud of them for speaking out and for really 
um, putting their pain out there because if any of you read the back and the hashtags of, about their experience with racism, reading those is just so painful. And I think it takes a lot of courage to do that. Um, at the same time, I think, um, you know, it, it's it, when you have been the target of that kind of hate for so many years, it, it's hard sometimes to offer grace to people mm -hmm. who are acting out of ignorance. So even if people are unintentional in causing harm, um, it's difficult for somebody who's been targeted to offer grace to that. It's to say, you know what, I don't care. I'm just tired of it, and I just wanted to stop. I don't want to hear anything negative anymore. And I think with the whole concept of love, which is why I was so happy when Alan reached out and was working on this, is that I think it's just a really misunderstood word. And, and people don't look at it as But imagine if we had leadership grounded in the concept of love. How great. Share one other thing, and then I'll promise I'll stop this. I think sometimes the worldview is people approach it from a scarce, there's not enough resources. So are you taking our jobs? Are you taking our spots in school versus kind of an abundance approach? Like there's there's really enough. And we're all alike, and we're all atoms, and we're the apple has a lot of things that we have in us, etc. But I think if you approach it from a, your worldview, sometimes helps you to do this us versus them, or we're all in this together. It's trying to help kind of a different lens. Great. Thank you. Have a good evening.